I'm Tom Baker, this is Chasing Cars, and this is the Audi Q5 45 TFSI Petrol. Long-time subscribers and eagle-eyed viewers will probably recognize this district green Audi Q5 behind me because this is a car that I did a shorter video with when talking about the new facelifted 2021 Q5 which came out mm, six months ago or so. It's kind of hard to pinpoint any particular event in the last two weeks slash two years of the pandemic, who can really tell? But in any case, in today's video, I'm gonna be talking much more specifically about the Q5 45 TFSI, the two litre turbo petrol engine that most people buy here in Australia when it comes to picking up a Q5. The four cylinder diesel also does big business. The SQ5 is also pretty popular, but the majority of people go for the 45 TFSI petrol. So what's it like? Is this actually the engine to buy? Are the running costs manageable? How much fuel does it use? And what's the Q5 like just as a luxury car to buy? In today's video, we're gonna check out the interior, the back seat, the boot, we'll discuss the running costs, and then we'll take the four cylinder petrol out onto the road. But I think we should just quickly start by going over what the basic choices are in the Q5 lineup, because there are three engines with four different badges, and it can get a little bit confusing at times. But before we get started, hit subscribe, help us out, get to that 100K mark. Now, this is the facelift Q5 wagon, if you like, but Audi have just introduced a sportback or more coupe styled version of the Q5 in Australia. So really the first step is deciding which of those shapes you like better. Now, I think Audi's sportback SUVs normally look quite good. The Q8 is quite handsome. The Q3 sportback is pretty cool. The Q5, I don't think the existing design really works with the sportback. We'll put a picture up at this point so you can see what I mean. So I'd go with the wagon body and then it comes down to which engine you want. Now, as I mentioned, this review is really about the 45 TFSI, which is the fastest petrol you can now get on the Q5 in Australia and the only petrol. It used to be that the SQ5 performance version of this SUV was petrol, now it's not. So if you want a gasoline motor in Australia, it's gonna be this one. It may have the Audi rings on it, but it's the Volkswagen Group EA888 two litre turbo four cylinder petrol engine under here, producing 183 kilowatts of power and 370 Newton meters of torque, or as I like to think of it in my mind, a Golf GTI with three extra kilowatts. Uh, but of course the Q5 has all wheel drive. Now it's a more responsive all wheel drive that can drive the front wheels alone when you're just driving very steadily on the highway, but any throttle application at all in this car sends some torque rearward. So that's certainly good to know. And the gearbox here is a seven speed wet clutch, dual clutch automatic transmission that Audi call S-Tronic, but there's no difference to the wet clutch Volkswagen DSG that you get in cars like the Golf R and the Golf GTI. So definitely a tried and tested dual clutch gearbox at this point. The other engine choices are the cheapest Q5, that's a 40 TDI, that's a two litre turbo diesel, making 150 kilowatts of power and 400 Newton meters of torque, which we took a look at recently in that comparison against the Genesis GV70, which the Audi actually won. Then there's a 50 TDI, that's a V6 three litre turbo diesel, making 210 kilowatts of power and 620 Newton meters of torque. Uh, an engine shared with the Q7, so it really goes like the clappers in the Q5. And then at the top of the lineup is the SQ5 TDI, which I've reviewed separately. That has a really beefed up three litre V6 diesel with a substantial mild hybrid system producing 251 kilowatts of power and 700 Newton meters of torque, and that is quick. But as we'll find, the two litre petrol actually isn't too bad in terms of performance. Next up, let's go inside. So what is life like inside the Audi Q5? Well, recently we had a look at that base diesel, which was the cheapest possible Q5 that you can get here in Australia, which doesn't get things like these sport seats, but pretty much any Q5 that you buy has a really decent interior from a quality perspective. But actually, probably the thing I like the best about the interior of the Audi Q5 is just how relaxing it is to look at. It's so not overdone. Like when you compare it to something like the Mercedes-Benz GLC, which has this big swooping center console and all of this detail it's it's quite beautiful but it's it's a lot to take in the Audi Q5 is really quite opposite uh, some people would call it plain and if you hate it that's fine but for me I really appreciate the restrained elegance of this interior and the layout of the dashboard which just keeps it simple but 
in general, there's enough buttons to get things done quickly, particularly around the climate control area, which continues to be traditional buttons and knobs in this car. Sadly, I can't say the same for the MMI system, which is now based around a touchscreen. The touchscreen itself is bright, crisp, quick, responsive, all the things you'd want a touchscreen to be. So no major complaints about interacting with that. It's just that in order to build this into the Q5, Audi decided to delete the old rotary MMI controller, which used to sit down here, and it's been rather unceremoniously replaced with a hole in the center console. Technically a storage area, but as I found, here's my iPhone 12 mini. Not even an iPhone mini fits into it, so fairly useless. I wish they had kept the rotary controller just as an extra option. And BMW really shows how to do this right because the X3 gives you a good touchscreen, but it also gives you an iDrive controller, best of both worlds. And they work better in different situations, right? So now I'm parked, obviously, got CarPlay up on the screen, which is wireless in the Q5, tremendous. I'd want to use the touchscreen. But driving over the kinds of bumpy B roads we have in Australia, you don't want to be using a touchscreen, you want to be using a rotary controller. So now you understand my obsession with that topic, hopefully. Now, in front of me, I have Audi's awesome virtual cockpit, still the best digital instrument cluster in the car industry. We've got a satellite map that I can put in front of me. It's like a sixth sense when you're driving, but we can also display loads of trip computer and media stuff, really customizable. And ooh, one thing I love about Audi's is just how clicky their buttons are. Really nice feedback. Now, what you'll see here is that somebody at Audi Australia uh, has taste because this car has been ordered in the Q5 facelift hero specification of distant green outside over Okapi brown leather. Now, this tan leather totally suits the interior design of an Audi. And you can see that after a few thousand Ks, the driver's seat is actually starting to wear quite nicely. Whereas black leather, I think, starts to look kind of ugly as it creases over time. Tan leather, it just looks lived in. And frankly, after I drove this car on the launch of the facelift Q5 a few months ago, I liked the Okapi brown interior so much that when I was helping a family member with a new A4 purchase um, the other month, I strongly encouraged them to buy Okapi brown seats, which they did, and they look absolutely tremendous. So do something bold, don't go for the black. This color is absolutely beautiful. Now, as I mentioned, the layout is relaxing, but quality is also high, and that's something that Audi has been good at for a long time. So, you know, everything feels really nicely screwed together, even though this is a Mexican Audi, not a German Audi. Most of the time, you can't tell. There's only one main area where I think the Q5 is oddly worse than the A4, which it's kind of the SUV equivalent of. And that's the grab handles for the doors, which are, hopefully you can hear that, squeaky and also rock hard. The A4 has lovely leather or leather-like uh, grab handles for the doors, which don't move an, a, a millimeter. They certainly don't make that squeaky sound and they're much more luxurious to hold on to. And they're color coded in the same color as the seats. Why doesn't the Q5 get that? No idea, but it feels a bit crap that it doesn't. Now, speaking of the seats themselves, they do have electric adjustment, four-way lumbar, manual thigh extender up front and seat heating, no seat cooling, so we don't have the full whack, but still pretty well set up. This car has the black headliner, panoramic sunroof in that. And then up here, we see some of the extra controls for what's called Audi Connect Plus in this car, which is the internet connected infotainment system. It's got Google Earth, it's got Google search results, but it can also tell you really useful stuff like petrol prices nearby, which is smart enough to know that this car needs premium octane fuel, but we also have an SOS button up here. We've got a maintenance button, all that stuff. Uh, and that activates automatically if you have a crash. The SOS one, not the maintenance one, because the maintenance probably takes a back seat in that situation. But either way, the Q5 feels thoroughly modern, even though this is only a facelift and not a brand new Audi. So that's the front seat. Let's check out the second row. So here in the back seat of the Q5, I think the first big impression that you get is it's not massive. It's certainly sufficient for four adults, this car, but the size difference between the Q5 and the Q7 is absolutely enormous. And so is the Q7, it's a freaking yacht. Whereas the Q5 is a much more usable size for most people. So unless you seriously need maximum interior space, the Q5, or alternatively, the A4 station wagon, which is much cooler again, should be sufficient for your needs. Now, 
I'm six foot, headroom, I've got enough of it. It's not huge, but I've got another inch or so underneath this panoramic sunroof. Leg room, behind my own driving position, that's okay. Toe room is also okay. The middle seat is a perch though, so I think you'll only want to use that if you really have to. But as I say, perfectly sufficient as a four-seater. Plus, we've got a bunch of amenities back here. Air vents, temperature control, two more USB ports, 12-volt socket, map pocket, flip-down armrest as well with two cup holders. Now, like the front seats, the door skins in the Q5, they are soft, but they're just a little bit tougher than you might expect. Ah, that's the one other thing I forgot to mention up front. This particular car is optioned with the Bang & Olufsen stereo, which is an upgrade over the standard Audi high performance system that you get on this particular Q5 variant. And it sounds excellent. For audiophiles, the Bang & Olufsen is the way to go. It does come at a premium, but it's clear, crisp, bassy, and the surround and 3D effects are actually really uh, very, very cool and they sound good. Here around the back of the facelift Audi Q5, again, the district green color is doing wonders for me. And this particular car has a black pack, uh, which is probably right for the, uh, for the green, I reckon. Usually I prefer the aluminum styling package on Audis, but it really does kind of depend on which color, which base color you go for. Now, the interesting thing about this particular example of the Audi Q5 is it's kitted out with the top lighting package you can get on this car. Now, Audi has always been interested in car lighting. They were among the first to do the sort of pearl necklace uh, daytime running lights, I don't know, more than a decade ago, I reckon. But now with the Q5, you can actually get these absolutely fascinating OLED tail lights that are responsive to how close a car is behind you. You can see that they're freaking out because I'm quite close to the sensors here, but they also change based on what drive mode you're in. So right now the car is sitting in sport mode or dynamic mode. If I pop it back into the automatic drive mode setting, you'll see that in the automatic setting, they've now gone back to a Q shape for like Audi Q, the SUVs. So that is awesome. Not the first time we've seen Audi OLED tail lights. I'm pretty sure they debuted on a TT RS a while ago, but they've now spread into the wider range. As you can see, they don't work especially well for car reviews because I'm standing here, but still a very cool feature. Now, power tailgate, that's standard across the range on the Audi Q5, and it opens up to reveal really a perfectly serviceable boot. 550 litres of capacity is par for the course for the luxury midsize SUV segment. We've got a cargo blind, nice and sturdy. We've got remote releases to drop those back seats. We've got uh, plenty of hooks. We've got nets aplenty, so nothing's going to roll around and uh, cause annoying noises from the boot. Also got this lovely finisher here to protect the paintwork. And underneath the boot floor, we've also got a space saver spare. Not as good as a full size, of course, but certainly better than nothing. And then controls up here to either close the power tailgate or close it and lock the vehicle. Last step for us before we take the four cylinder petrol Q5 onto the road is to talk about the running costs. So what's it gonna cost you to run a Q5 with the 45 TFSI petrol engine? Well, a little bit more than the diesels in terms of fuel consumption. The good rule of thumb that I found in my pretty thorough testing of this Q5 is that in virtually any situation, it uses about two liters per 100 kilometers more than the four cylinder diesel and around a liter per 100 kilometers more than the V6 diesel option that you can get in the 50 TDI version of the Q5. But that said, the fuel consumption is still good and that's because the Volkswagen Group EA888 2 litre turbo petrol engine under the bonnet of this SUV is pretty fuel efficient and then Audi adds on a mild hybrid system on top of it for things like extended start stop. The engine subtly dies off underneath like 22 kilometers per hour and that works well. So in town, we managed about 9.5 liters per 100 Ks. On the highway, we managed around 7.5 liters per 100, which is acceptable. If you do drive long distance, country miles, consider the diesel options instead. Now, Audi sell service packs for the Q5 and the 45 TFSI's plan will set you back $3,140 for a five year, 75,000 kilometer plan, which is at the more expensive end for this segment, but it is transferable to new owners as well. Now, the warranty on the vehicle is actually only three years with unlimited kilometers, and it's about time Audi matched Mercedes-Benz for their five year unlimited kilometer warranty in this segment. And if you're negotiating on a Q5, you should demand a five year warranty be thrown in for free, or you're gonna go up the road and buy a GLC instead. And lastly, insurance. 
In the last 12 months, the median budget direct customer spent $1,555 to comprehensively ensure a new Audi Q5. Everybody's situation varies and your premium will vary based on things insurers take into account, like where you live, how you garage the car, your driving history, etc. So you'll remember that I posed the question in the intro, should you buy your Q5 with the 45 TFSI petrol engine? Well, that's what I'm really gonna be focusing on in my driving comments today. I've already got a general Audi Q5 review up on the channel uh, of the facelifted version where I talk at length about the different suspension options that you can get in this car. Uh, and I've also got an SQ5 review up on the channel that talks about the top of the tree Q5 that is actually really great. Um, but today I'm gonna to be focusing on the 45 TFSI petrol four cylinder. So first of all, what is it? Well, we already had a quick look under the bonnet, but it's the Volkswagen Group EA888 motor, two liter turbo petrol four cylinder, making 183 kilowatts of power and 370 Newton meters of torque. So pretty healthy outputs and four cylinder turbo petrol engines have come really far in the last decade. Uh, as diesel has started to go out of fashion, kind of out of fashion more with, with car makers and regulators than it has with people that actually buy these cars who tend to kind of like diesels in midsize SUVs, the petrols have gotten much better. They've gotten more fuel efficient, torquier, and certainly quieter uh, and more refined. And you get all of those benefits in the Q5 45 TFSI, and it certainly helps that the the four-cylinder engine used in this car is, I mean, it's beyond tried and tested. The Volkswagen Group have used this engine for almost 20 years, and it's gone through constant iteration through that time, making it faster, better, quieter, smoother, uh, and better for the environment too. Uh, and so when you drive it here in a 2021 Q5, it still feels really fresh as a daisy. Now this isn't the fastest Q5, both the diesel uh, V6, the 50 TDI, and the other diesel V6, the SQ5 TDI, are quicker than the 45 TFSI, but it is notably more rapid than the base Q5, which has a four cylinder diesel engine. And it's also a fair bit quieter and considerably smoother than the four cylinder diesel. And so I guess for people that really have something against that kind of clattery diesel noise which is suppressed in the q5 but it's still there you can still kind of hear it um, you know this petrol is lovely when you accelerate with a bit of verve instead of getting clatter you get that raspy uh, you know petrol four cylinder note which sounds pretty good definitely sounds better than the base diesel and on light throttle in the diesel you just hear it quietly working away the difference with the petrol on light throttle is you basically don't hear it at all. Um, so it is very, very quiet and very refined. It also really leaps off the line, this petrol. The gearing is pretty short in the low gears, uh, and that really gives it the ability to just pounce from launch. It sends quite a lot of torque rearward. Uh, the Quattro system, or what's branded as Quattro in the Q5, but to save fuel when you're just driving steadily on the highway or at a steady speed like I am now on this suburban street, it's front drive. As soon as you put any throttle in at all, even light throttle, uh, it sends torque rearward and uh, you never really get acceleration in the Q5 that isn't all wheel drive. So it's not a kind of reactive system. Instead, it's just if you're accelerating, it's all wheel drive. But if you're just sort of steady speed on the highway, it's two-wheel drive, as in front-wheel drive. That's quite different to the V6 versions of the Q5, which have a true, uh, more Torsen-style all-wheel drive system where it's actually rear-biased all of the time. So it's rare to have a car where the two all-wheel drive systems are so different, but that's how it is in the Q5. But from an outcomes-based perspective, what do I actually experience as a driver? The outcomes are actually very, very similar. The Q5 45 TFSI never feels front wheel drive. If it's slippery out and you put your foot down, you just get that sort of four square quattro-ish all wheel drive feeling, which is great for sort of secure uh, cornering on throttle. Of course, all wheel drive can't help you when you're off throttle. But speaking of that, we actually have Pirelli Scorpion Zero tires, Pirelli's high spec all season tire uh, on this SUV and they're really grippy actually. It can corner really quite well. 
um, partially because this particular Q5 is specified with 20 inch wheels. Um, so the wheels are not as chunky as the base model diesel that I drove recently, uh, which had 19s that delivered a really good ride quality. Um, the ride is definitely not as good uh, on 20s, but there's a litany of suspension choices that you have in the Q5 that can actually be uh, really confusing. And I continue to believe that like any expensive luxury SUV like this should just ride well no matter what, but sadly it's not to be. And this particular Q5 has no assistance other than it's just regular fixed damper setup. And we've got those bigger 20 inch wheels and sadly it does find potholes and urban imperfections too much but you've got two levels above this of suspension. You've got adaptive dampers, and then you've got adaptive air suspension. And on the Q5, the air suspension is the way to go. It delivers a really good ride quality. It's a fairly pricey option, but if this is gonna be a car that you're gonna drive a lot, you're gonna keep it for at least a few years and do you know many miles in it, then you want a decent suspension. And the air suspension is what delivers you that vibe in really any MLB car, but particularly in the Q5, which suffers from being um, quite tall, quite short. So it's already up against all of these points that make it harder to deliver kind of plush ride quality. So you really need the air suspension to do that job in my opinion. It's subjective, you can test drive it, but always remember on your test drive, you've got to take the car to the roads that you know. So take it home, take it to the suburb you live in because you know where the bumps are, you know where the crappy surfaces are and drive over them and see how it feels. That doesn't just apply to an Audi Q5, that's any car. Don't get distracted by the nice glossy roads near the dealership, just a tip. But refinement is superb in the Q5. It's quiet, it's comfortable. The Bang & Olufsen stereo in this example sounds fantastic. The wireless CarPlay works well. It hasn't dropped out for me during my week of testing. The virtual cockpit with the satellite mapping is so sophisticated. And like most cars Audi produces, the Q5 just comes together in such a way that makes you go, ah, right. These guys really know how to screw together a car and how to make all of these systems work in concert. The same also goes for the safety tech. The lane keep assist is good it's strong but subtle you know so it will correct your line if you're doing something silly but it leaves you alone the rest of the time and doesn't embarrass you which is nice we've got adaptive cruise again well tuned we've got a, a blind spot monitoring system in the mirrors not as good as the genesis gv70's blind spot cameras but still you know it's good to have it and we have a very crisp 360 degree camera in the Q5, which makes this SUV easier to park. Plus there is reversing AEB on this vehicle. So those are my impressions of the new Audi Q5 with the four cylinder turbo petrol engine, the 45 TFSI. And I think this powertrain is gonna be right for most people that want a Q5 here in Australia. It balances decent power and torque with acceptable fuel economy and really good refinement actually. Uh, for those that do longer miles, either the four cylinder or the six cylinder diesel could make more sense, but if you're mostly hanging around town, the petrol is actually quite a nice thing to drive. Now, what I would do is specify a Q5 in an interesting color combination, like this one. District green over a carpy brown is one way to do it, but there's a beautiful navy, there's a burgundy, there's beige, there's gray inside. There's all sorts of different options that you could consider with the Q5 that aren't black on black. That's my opinion though. You can let me know if you agree down below the video. While you're there, make sure to hit subscribe and the notification bell. We're pretty close to 100K, so you can make a real difference by subscribing there. And as always, thanks for watching Chasing Cars.